Africa is the fastest growing continent. 10 out of 12 fastest growing economies in the world are African. Despite remaining conflicts, Africa today is more stable and more peaceful than ever. Nevertheless, high economic growth does not always or automatically bring about change in living standards and quality of life. That is why the Czech Republic encourages the idea of regional integration. We ourselves have been enriched by our membership in the European Union, the Visegrad Group and other regional organizations. I am pleased to say that Africa speaks more and more with one voice, as the recent African Union summit in Addis Ababa has just shown. The African Union and regional organizations are more active and show more ownership in regional integration and cooperation, good governance, conflict prevention and resolution. More regional integration brings more trade and more prosperity. It helps to prevent conflicts as well. Our two regions are advancing together in the construction of the EU-Africa relationship. Europe and Africa are connected by many historical, economic, human and cultural ties. We are geographic neighbors and partners in our common future. The joint EU-Africa strategic partnership adopted in 2007 has shown results but needs to become a more active instrument for further cooperation and partnership between the EU and Africa. The months left to the next Africa-EU summit in 2014 should be used to reflect on ways how to strengthen our partnership even more. The Czech Republic's interest in Africa is also growing. Mutual Czech-African trade is rising and the Czech exports to Africa grow faster than to the rest of the world. Even though the volume remains relatively low, there is a huge potential for further growth. What the Czech Republic seeks in relation to Africa is not only trade. We have always strongly supported exchanges in educational and academic fields. Educational cooperation is not only about scholarships, but also about exchanges of postgraduate students, professors, researchers, and common projects between Czech and African institutes and universities. We plan to continue to be active even more in this direction. Many Africans who studied at Czech universities have attained important posts of responsibility in their home countries, and we are proud of their achievements. We support the efforts of African governments and the civil society in the area of good governance and respect for human rights. We promote these values through our development aid and aid projects. And I am happy to say that these values are more and more accepted throughout the continent. I wish that today's conference would contribute to our mutual understanding. And I wish you all an interesting and fruitful discussion. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> now, I would like to pass the floor to Ambassador Belay Tajin, uh, Ambassador of Algeria, who will deliver uh, the second opening speech. Dear Vice Minister, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, before to start, I want to say a warm welcome to our special guest, Ambassador Brandeo. As you know, this year Africa celebrates under the theme Pan-Africanism and the African Renaissance, its 50th anniversary of the foundation of the Organization of African Unity, which now became the African Union. Major requirements and some fundamental principles emerge from the organization, such as, such as the decolonization and struggle against apartheid. The respect of the borders inherited from the colonial period the respect of sovereignty and the non-interference in internal affairs. In particular, the consecration of the principle of the inviolability of borders inherited from colonialism probably avoided a flashover on the continent and another balkanization. Trying to implement the founding fathers' ideals, the OU was assigned huge goals to achieve, but nevertheless, 
realize the overreaching goal justifying its existence, which is the political liberation of the continent, dignity, and end of apartheid. The return of South Africa to the great African family with Nelson Mandela as its head has been another major event. Thus, the OU helped in the emancipation movement of African people and third world countries with an unsuspected dynamism and consolidated its, posi its position among the international institutions acting within the group of 77, the movement of non-aligned and the UN bodies. Its, mot its most notable action was undoubtedly the support of the decolonization in providing continuous assistance to the movement struggling for independence. In the joint action, the OU has never ceased to play a unifying role in promoting active solidarity with its African members and in international bodies. It really became the voice of long marginalized people. And if Africa is today knocking at the Security Council's door, it's only fair. If the OU has taken over the previous objectives assigned to the OU, it distinguished itself by a wider field of cooperation and integration, including, among others, issues related to security, democracy, rule of law, good governance, or human rights. Another sign of its maturity is that it has created more institutional bodies such as the African Court of Justice, the African Parliament, and especially a unique instrument of self-participatory assessment, which is the African peer review mechanism initiated by Nepal. The OU has always been involved in the peaceful resolution of inter-African conflicts through its mediation, conciliation, and arbitration committee. And later on, in establishing a high-level mechanism to prevent, manage, and resolve African conflicts. In addition, Africa tends nowadays to occupy an important place in the world as another center of global and strong growth with rates that exceed, in some countries, 6%. In short, Africa became an interactive economic actor and is also changing. The arrival of educated peoples, in particular women, also the civil society, and the introduction of new technologies and communication changed the structures and the scene. Everywhere, sustained urbanization and realistic economic policies contribute to the emergence and development of an, a middle class which attracts foreign investors and promotes positively political changes on the continent, including the accession to power by democratic way and means. The significant, the significant challenges, of course, remain poverty, development, food safety, as infrastructure deficit still hampers an effective integration. To these challenges, we must add the issues of climate change, sustainable development, and green growth, as well as the respect for democratic principles, human rights, and rule of law that still have a long way to go before getting permanently anchoring, anchored in African societies. And the imperative of peace, security, and stability are still prerequisite for any business development. But Africa is on the right way, and its economy is one of the most promise, promising of the next decade. In this framework, African Union has a continental strategy known as NEPAL, we, <coughs> the EU Partnership for Africa's Development, which is a program designated to propel the development of Africa in attracting foreign investments in strategic sectors. By the way, it is thanks to this credible program and other successes of Africa that our continent became a regular guest of G8, of the G8, and then a real partner of the great powers. Indeed, 
Africa began in the recent decade <coughs> some major reforms, getting stronger economic growth and showing a new face that allows it to attract international investors. The relative withdrawal, withdrawal of Western companies in recent years left room to new actors from other continents, especially Asia and Latin America. The diversification and orientation of trade investment flows has also reduced the dependence of Africa on traditional partner economies and led it to further rely on emerging economies less affected by the crisis. The opening of Africa towards the new partners, the new partners terminates in reality the long-term exclusive face-to-face -face between Europe and Africa. But it doesn't mean that the continent is about to turn its back on all ties. But in contrary, it wishes it to be a win-win relationship purged of any post-colonial hints. In this context, the African-European -Europe relations can lead to a strategic relationships, a true partnership going beyond the strictly commercial framework. Indeed, the relative stagnation currently being lived in Europe can become an incentive reason for a strong redeployment tour towards its closest neighbor. The African partner has never been in such good condition to start a strong partnership with Europe. There is much to do in Africa and for everyone because nowadays the continent is in good position and market shares are within reach of, da of daring part entrepreneurs. The Czech Republic, given the narrowness, <coughs> the narrowness of its own market and the contraction of the European one, has every everything to gain from the African market. The Czech Republic has many industrial and economic advantage advantages in its favor and has no hindrance of colonial past. It has a positive image thanks to the humanitarian, technical, and military assistance provided in the past by the former Czechoslovakia, to the national liberation movements, and to the young and dependent countries in the reconstruction. This good prospect is one of the themes of today's seminar and will also to be a subject to a more specific conference devoted to the Czech Republic versus Africa to be held next September in these premises, we hope. Thank you for having organized this seminar, which will certainly be productive thanks to the contribution of all participants. And thank you for your kind attention. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Deputy Ministers. Uh, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is Petr Kratochil, I'm the director of the Institute of International Relations, and I'm one, uh, our institute is one of the co-organizers of this event. So uh, please uh, allow me to start with thanking our partners in uh, organizing this, this event, that is the Czech Ministry of Foreign Affairs and uh, the African embassies located in Prague. Um, our panel will uh, deal with the relations between the Czech Republic and Africa. Now, uh, this issue can be tackled from many different perspectives, but I would like to point to one important issue, and that is, of course, the uh, motto of the, of the whole conference, and that's Africa Rising. In 2011, uh, The Economist published a very influential article entitled Africa rising with a question mark. Uh, and since then there has been, if you, if you try to Google out uh, the words Africa rising, you will get hundreds of results. So clearly this is a topic that resonates in the public. Uh, there are a number of arguments, both political and economic in favor of this claim. Uh, uh, some of those uh, economic arguments 
uh, have been already mentioned here, let me repeat that many of the fastest growing economies are in Prague, uh, in, sorry, in Africa, not in Prague, unfortunately, um, uh, uh, in Africa. Uh, if you count the number of mobile phones in Africa, it's more than in Europe or than, uh, or than in, in America. If you look at some predictions and forecasts, there are those uh, uh, like the World Bank who claim that by 2015 there will be 100 million Africans with, with an income of at least $3,000. Uh, annual income, so there is a growing middle class as well on the continent. There are also political arguments in favor of the claim. If you look at the number of peacefully, of peaceful change of governments before 1990, you will find out that there is not a single one. But if you look at the development after 1991, you will have at least 30 such, such peaceful, uh, peaceful changes. So it shows that it's not only a question of, of economic changes on the continent, but there is also something happening in, in political terms, something positive happening in political terms. But of course, uh, not everything uh, uh, that glitters is gold, uh, and there are a number of obstacles Af Africa is still facing, ranging from from the uh, rampant uh, corruption in some countries to environmental problems to uh, a high or perhaps excessive dependence on, on mineral resources and so on and so forth. And I, I'm sure we will discuss all these issues here uh, on this panel, but there is also a, a second question and that is the question which was already uh, tackled by uh, uh, Mr. Ambassador, and that is where is the place of the Czech Republic in, in all these developments? And, and that, I think, is a, a second big question which we will try to, to discuss during our conference here. Um, of course, I will not give the answer to these questions because I'm sure we'll hear the answer from the answers from the other speakers, but I would like to point in some directions where there is I believe a huge potential for, for uh, or channels of influence and cooperation between the Czech Republic and, and uh, uh, Africa. Uh, one of those is, of course, the traditional ties between the Czech Republic or Czechoslovak Czechoslovakia before uh, and some African uh, countries which are now uh, partially uh, being revived. The second, uh, equally important, is the multilateral cooperation in the framework of the EU. And of course, the Czech Republic has been traditionally focused more on, on the EU's neighbors, especially in the Eastern neighborhood. But th there is much talk in, in uh, uh, Czech diplomatic circles about, about diversification, both in economic terms and, and also in political terms. So Africa is, is a potential market in, uh, or potential ally in that sense as well. And finally, there is, of course, uh, growing security involvement of the Czech Republic as well. As you know, there is the mission in Mali um, and uh, economic investments of the country uh, on the continent as well. So, so there is a number of uh, various areas where, where uh, the Czech Republic can cooperate. Uh, with Africa. Now the question is whether uh, the Czech Republic will indeed succeed. Uh, but again, this is not uh, for me to answer. And with that, I'd like to pass the floor to, to our speakers and I'll just briefly introduce them in the order as, as, they, are, uh, as they appear uh, in the program. So I'll start with uh, Olivia Boca, um, uh, who is the founder and director of Strategico, uh, which is a company specializing in risk assessment and financial analysis of, of uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, uh, Mrs. Boca is uh, based in France, but uh, also very active in, in other European countries. I have to say that she also uh, gives regular lectures at the Prague University of Economics, so we are uh, colleagues in a sense because I give lectures there as well. So that's uh, Lydia Boca who will speak first. Then uh, we'll uh, pass the floor to uh, Ambassador Ajay uh, Bramdeo, uh, who is the African Union's permanent representative to the European Union and the uh, ACP group as well. Uh, Ambassador Bramdeo uh, uh, has held a number of, uh, that's a long list of uh, diplomatic posts. I will not 
uh, uh, name them all because you'll spend too much time with that, but I'll just point out that, that he has served in a number of African countries uh, and elsewhere. Um, then um, uh, the floor will be passed to uh, Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs, Tomasz Dub, um, who um, uh, worked for some time at the Ministry of Economy of the Czech Republic. Then also he held a number of uh, various positions uh, dealing with foreign policy uh, in the Prague City Council, uh, in the Czech Parliament as well, and now he's, he's um, uh, uh, Deputy Minister of Minister Schwarzenberg. And finally, uh, last but not least, uh, our final speaker will be uh, Toma, uh, Peter Lebeda, uh, who is uh, director, the director of Glopolis, uh, a think tank that deals of, uh, with a number of interesting topics ranging from sustainable development to food security and many other issues, internet, global political economy as well. So I think the composition of the panel is quite balanced. We have representatives of both uh, politics, uh, NGOs, uh, business as well. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to, to our discussion. I, I would like to ask each of the speakers to speak for about 10 to 15 minutes so that we have enough time for, for the subsequent discussion. So Lydia, the floor is yours. Your Excellencies, honorable guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very honored to be here today. I want to thank the Czech Republic for inviting me. First of all, um, what we should stress is the fact that Africa is no longer business as usual. Those who've spoken before me have told you that it's the continent where countries are among the fastest growing economies in the world, and I want to confirm that. As a risk analyst, it's uh, not usual to speak about good things. It's uh, our business is to look at problems. But if I'm here to speak to you about opportunities, it means they are really there in Africa. So let's forget about the image um, of uh, children in refugee camps, of famine, of war, and things like that. And uh, looking at what's going on in the continent today with partners from all over the world, it means that even if a country is risky, there are opportunities, at, at least in the short term. And I think the Czech Republic has understood that and knows that very well for hosting such an event. Sure, some of the problems are still there, um, but every day there are leaders in the continent who are working towards a better Africa. I take a few examples. Unusual. Unusual example is that of Cape Verde, a small country, a small island off the Senegalese coast with no natural resources. At independence in the mid 70s, per capita income was barely 150 US dollars. I think it was exactly 133. Today, Cape Verde is a middle income country with per capita income of almost 3,500 US dollars. Not a coincidence, it's a country where the literacy rate is among the highest in Africa. It's the country where the press is the, press is the freest. It's a country where the prime minister is from a different political party than the president, and there was no blood spilled. It's also the country where the social indicators are among the highest. This is where Africa wants to go. Another example is that of Rwanda, also a small country, still considered poor, not in the middle income country category, but uh, that recovered from the ashes, literally, from the genocide about 15, 16 years ago. I'm talking about the economic uh, success, not politics, because that's another issue, and we can openly debate. Um, Rwanda today has been able to halve poverty in just 15 years. And that's something that other Africans, uh, African countries can learn and, and uh, replicate. Sure, um, we have commodity dependency in Africa. 
among the 22 MICs, middle income countries, eight are commodity dependent. So I'm talking about Angola, uh, the third largest economy of Africa. I'm talking about Nigeria and a few others. But the good news is that there are also eight new MICs that are countries where the middle class is emerging, like in Ghana, like in Cote d'Ivoire. Countries have learned, and uh, I, would, I would rather say leaders know that uh, mistakes from the past should be avoided. Mistakes being basing one's economy development on a single commodity export. Countries want to transform their economies, the structures of the economies, meaning moving away from the primary sectors to secondary and tertiary sectors, uh, like services, like industry, uh, because if we buy um, 26 million mobile phones for 25 million people, it's good, but it's good for Huawei, it's good for uh, other manufacturers in other parts of the world, and it's useless if Africa is not producing its own mobile phones. So this is where the countries want to go, not being a recipient of Chinese plastic, for example. Make your own plastic and think about the environment. So these MICs, a couple of years back, there were just five or six. I'm, uh, I'm talking about the usual suspect being Mauritius, Seychelles, South Africa, Botswana. Now you have diverse countries like Cape Verde. And it's irreversible. Why is it irreversible? Because Africans are better informed, are better trained. Uh, there's globalization, there's satellite, there's mobile phone. What the internet did in Northern Africa with the Arab Spring, the mobile phone is doing the same in Sub-Saharan Africa. A farmer or a young person in a village has a mobile phone, so leaders can no longer um, tell stories uh, to the same people. So there's enhanced responsibility. There is, uh, they become more account accountable. And I think they're more inclined themselves because we've got better leaders than in the past. Uh, from about 50 dictators at independence, 50 years on, uh, it was about time that that number, according to our own accounting, is down to 18. And I'm not going to name them unless you ask. So it's really good news. And as I mentioned, um, the world is there. Who is there? In addition to the traditional partners with whom relationships are not always easy for um, sentimental reasons, China is grabbing the opportunities. Because you might see Africa as a problematic um, area, war torn and, and so on. Chinese would go there and say they do not interfere in uh, domestic politics and they'll make mis business and they'll get paid. They don't speak the local language, but how do you think they're making you know, business? I'm not gonna quote the figures, but we can do that a bit later. On the heels of China is India that set its own India-Africa uh, summit in 2008. By the way, the Chinese have held five since the year 2000, and it gives them, in addition to the friendship stadiums and uh, hospitals that they finance in the continent, it gives them uh, uh, some clout uh, in Africa. So India's done the same. India's pledged five billion US dollars um, over a limited period of time to help Africa in capacity building in that order, capacity building and training and then infrastructure development, which is a huge problem in Africa uh, because of its sheer size, and then commerce. And uh, trade relationships are around six billion US dollars, and by 2015, they're going to be twice as much, 90 billion. Other non-traditional partners from Southeast Asia are there with or without the state, um, 
Now we see also Russia in the commodity sector and Japan. Japan was there uh, with its aid included in the OECD package. Last week, Japan held its TCAD meeting in Tokyo and pledged 32 billion US dollars over a period of five years to develop infrastructure and other sectors. Of course, it's also interested in resources with the huge uh, Rovuma basin, the gas of the Mozambique coast. It was there right from the beginning, two, three years ago, and that also gives Japan some clout. So what do you do if you don't have Japan's money? A lot of things. A lot of things, uh, I, I think a country like the Czech Republic, with no colonial past, has an opportunity to provide advisory services to enhance cooperation in education and human rights and uh, help the countries better as assess what the others are offering. Because I can tell you that indeed China is big in Africa uh, doing business, it's an opportunity for Africa, but it's also a threat because those deals are done between government and China. <coughs> and the people are not always consulted and the people do not always feel that their representatives represent them well. So there are problems in villages and things like that. So in advocacy and uh, in reviewing those rights. Now there's Brazil which is moving away from its traditional partners of the CPLP, the Portuguese speaking countries community to other African uh, countries. It forgave 900 million in African debt also last week or two weeks ago. Um, Africa has learned, you know, not to bargain, but uh, to make its uh, friendship worthwhile. It helped uh, Brazil rec recently to win the WTO uh, leadership. It's the foreign affair minister, I think, who is now the head of WTO with the help of African countries. And of course, India is interested in the seat in the UN Security Peace Council. And African countries have an advantage. There are numerous countries and their voices are interesting. So I'm not gonna give you too many numbers. Uh, Turkey is also coming from humanitarian aid a couple of years back. It's one of the few countries that's present in difficult places like Somalia. And of course, it's also doing business. And, and Russia, I mentioned. So all these people and countries with states, all just the private sector are there for a reason. And Africa welcomes them. I think uh, the continent is dealing with a powerful uh, partner being China uh, and is not always speaking in one voice, I'm sorry to say. And uh, in a couple of years, it could pose a problem. It's good that China is providing an, alter an alternative to African countries with resources, with money, and so on. But 54 or 55 small or larger countries Dealing with one big China, I think it's not always. Uh, Africa should have a common policy to deal with China. And the problem is going to be seen in a couple of years. To conclude, I'm gonna say the picture is getting brighter. We, are, we have less strong men in Africa and stronger institutions and stronger women. And this is the future. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much. I think you, you mentioned two big questions that uh, need to be asked here. The first is, of course, who benefits, qui bono? Is it, is it, is it the Chinese? Is it a narrow uh, domestic African elite? Or is it, is it the population at large? And of course, there is the, the other question as well, and that's often discussed today, and that's manufacturing in Africa. There, nobody really talks about, when we talk about the rise of Africa, we talk about the rise of GDP, we talk about 
um, uh, the mineral uh, riches in Africa, but but uh, there is no increase in, 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 in manufacturing in many countries. And the question is, uh, should Africa in fact follow that path? Should it become a second China, so to speak, to, to export uh, goods to the world, or should it be rather service-based? And that's, that's another uh, big strategic uh, discussion. But bef before we come back to these questions, I would like to ask Ambassador Bramdale for, for a brief intervention. Thank you very much, uh, moderator and chair of our panel. Um, Excellency, um, the deputy minister, ambassadors, fellow panelists. It's always difficult to follow on two very good interventions. It's almost as if I sat together with Ms. Boka and the dean of the African Diplomatic Corps and planned the same interventions. Um, they have raised some very relevant points. Um, I would like to, with your permission, take it a step further. I would like to suggest that uh, over the last 15 years or so, there was a confluence of uh, sort when soon after the fall of the Berlin Wall, um, and the um, emergence of a democratic South Africa, the organization of African unity had then um, realized its main objectives, the main political objectives that it had. Uh, one was freeing Africa from colonialism, and the second was um, overcoming the system of apartheid in South Africa. At the same time, we found that there was an emergence of a new world order, a new global order. And in this time, Africa had to carry out some introspection as to what would the relevance of a continental body now be. How do we proceed with regional integration and what becomes the main objective of our organization. And so we had discussions from the late 1990s until about 2002, when we had a transformation process that took place from the Organization of African Unity to the African Union. And the African Union was launched in 2002, and with the African Union came the, um, the objective of achieving an African renaissance. It was the first time that we were starting to talk about this again since our founding fathers had actually formed the Organization of African Unity. And the focus was now shifting to how do we develop Africa? What should Africa's development agenda be? How will we achieve development in Africa? We need to fight poverty, because poverty had become enemy number one in Africa. And so an assessment was done of all the potential that Africa holds, and what would be the best way of actually positively exploiting this potential to the benefit of Africa and the African people. And here is where the, the um, ambassador of uh, Algeria raised the, the question around the development of NEPAD. NEPAD became a socioeconomic blueprint for the development of Africa. And it was fine-tuned later to include that aspect which spoke to democracy, good governance, human rights, etc., through the setting up of the African peer review mechanism. And the recognition came from the fact that peace and security and development go hand in hand. In order to have development, you have to have a peaceful, a secure, and a stable environment. But 
having achieved peace and stability, if there is no development, you're going to fall back into the cycle of insecurity and instability. So that nexus between peace and security and development then informed to a large extent the strategy uh, that needed to be followed. And last year, the African Union celebrated its 10th anniversary. And in that short 10 years, a lot had been achieved towards placing the African continent on the path to sustainable development. Now, of course, in an ideal world, which was not dynamic, and where there were no forces that could be opposing what the African continent was working towards, we would have achieved all our results. But since the stated aims of the uh, targets that were set for the Millennium Development Goals, we know that over a 15-year period, we are going to miss many of these targets come 2015. Even though we have made progress, we have improved on the environment, and the distinguished speakers before me have already stated the difference in the African political and economic um, environment today as compared to 15 years ago, we have seen remarkable progress. 10 years or 15 years is not a long time for a continent or the continental organization to try and move forward, particularly with 54 or 55 countries. The European Union now has 27 member states, exactly half of the African Union. And yet, sometimes the European Union also has difficulties in taking a step forward because you need to have consensus, you need to have agreement uh, amongst all those with disparate levels of development, with different national interests, etc. Now imagine a continent of 54 countries trying to do the same. So if you look at it from that perspective, we've done quite well over the last 10 years or so. If we look at the practical level, um, Ms. Boca has spoken about the, the types of partnerships that Africa has got with individual countries and with regions. And the European Union is probably the most important region with whom Africa has got a partnership. It's a region-to-region -region partnership. With China, Turkey, India, Korea, we have one country having a partnership with all of Africa, even Japan. But with the European Union, it's one regional organization to another with Africa. And in this sense, and because of our history, we have a partnership that has to work. No matter what the difficulties are, we'll have our ups and downs, but we will have to live with each other. Because in this partnership lies our respective salvation. Right now, with the EU going through its very difficult economic and financial crisis for the last three or four or five years, we find that all of the economies of the European Union are starting to suffer and feel the impact of this crisis. And the crisis is deepening. Africa is also feeling the impact of the crisis within the Eurozone. It is affecting our development cooperation. It is making national governments revisit their policies. 
their bilateral policies with individual African countries. National governments, when they go to the EU meetings now, you find that there is a different um, angle or perspective through which they look at issues of cooperation between the EU and Africa. Now, all that has been said about Africa, its potential, its enormous wealth, the opportunities that are presented in Africa, it's almost as if there is a new scramble for Africa, an economic scramble, because the wealth and the potential and opportunity of Africa has to be tapped. It is upon which the global economy can probably be kick-started. That is how important, I would say, the resources of Africa are. And this is why we find many of the major emerging economies, as well as the established and developed economies are looking to Africa. Africa has been open for business for a few years. The common policy that we are trying to develop and adopt in the various areas is based on the priorities that Africa sees for itself. We now talk of sustainable development goals. We talk of the post-2015 development agenda. And Africa, the African Union, has embarked on a Vision 2063 exercise. So from 1963 to 2013, our 50th anniversary this year, we have sat and reviewed what were the achievements, what do we have to be proud of, what have we not achieved, what can be done better, where do we want to be in another 50 years' time as a continent. And this is what Vision 2063 hopes to achieve. It is currently work in progress and it will be adopted, it will be presented to the African heads of state at the next summit in January next year and discussed and debated. But the 2015, the post-2015 development agenda has to be in synergy with this vision 2063. Everything has to come together. We cannot have um, exercises that would be parallel to each other or in competition with each other. We have to make these come together as a one cohesive policy. And we are hoping to achieve this. And within all of this, we have to look at how do we achieve our goals. Africa has seen fairly decent levels of foreign direct investment. It's not what it should be. It's still in the global uh, scheme of things, a rather small percentage of foreign direct investment that we see. However, what does Africa need to do to increase this? We are trying to bring about peace and stability through our intervention with our partners' support. We are also trying to harmonize our policies to make investment more attractive. However, this is where we come across a double-edged sword. With 54 or 55 countries competing for investment, you find that very often the investor plays the one against the other and says, well, look, your investment policy says X, Y, and Z, but if I come in, I'm going to create so many jobs, I'm going to do this for your economy, I would like to renegotiate your investment code 
so that it's more flexible. And uh, sometimes, of course, government officials are offered incentives. I'm being very nice over here and using the word invent uh, incentives to be flexible and to change the policy for that investor's benefit. And this is where we see corruption starting to take root because the incentives could be seen as being bribery, being a kickback, being something or the other. And so you have a corrupter and then you may have a corruptee who's on the take. And the message is quite clear. If you do not accommodate us by being flexible in your investment policy, we'll go to your neighbor and we'll invest over there because they are willing to uh, be flexible. So what happens? You play off one country against the other to the detriment of that own country because now the investment policy has to be tailor-made for each investor. And I think this has been the practice to date. Now, if anyone comes to the Czech Republic and says, look, this is what your investment policy says, but I'm coming in with a, a billion euros, can you be flexible? Please, uh, give me this, that, and the other thing over and above whatever else your investment policy has. I do not know, uh, Deputy Minister, how your government will deal with such investors. But sometimes the investors that come to Africa are richer, more powerful, and more influential, and they have the backing of their government tacitly. And here sits a poor, weak head of state or government ministers, and you have to now take decisions in the interest of your country. Now, that is just one scenario that African governments face in reality. I'll give you another example. Africa places a lot of emphasis. One of our top priorities is development of the agricultural sector through the Comprehensive African Agriculture Development Program, KDAP. Through the development of the agricultural sector and agro-processing, we are hoping to have food security as well as be able to export food to other continents. But over the last five years or so, we have a new phenomenon that we have to deal with. There are foreign investors who are willing to come into Africa and to get involved in what is euphemistically called large-scale farming. In other words, the foreign investor will lease or buy off hundreds, if not thousands, of hectares of prime arable land and then conduct commercial farming purely for the basis of exporting to their own countries to feed their own populations. Using the arable land, the labor, and everything else from the host country. The civil society activists call this land grabbing. Now there's morality that comes into it. There's scruples. Should Africa accept such investments. If they don't, then African governments are told, you don't have the correct investment policies. You see, we brought you all our transnational companies. They're willing to put in billions into your agriculture development program, and you are denying them the opportunity. But how can a government with a clear conscience welcome such investors? In whose interest are the investors investing? Every investor wants to make a profit, but we cannot be economic mercenaries. Money has no conscience, but surely then an investor should have a conscience. So when we deal with Africa, any businessman who wishes to come ought to come and treat the people of Africa and negotiate on the same basis as he would in his own country. 
on he, in his own region. But very often we find that there is a cultural gap that exists in doing business. And perhaps this is where I could advise that yes, the Czech Republic has to identify in its development of its foreign policy towards Africa exactly what it is that the foreign policy of the Czech Republic wishes to achieve. What are the objectives? On what basis will the Czech Republic engage with Africa? And once that policy has been drafted, the private sector will certainly have a role to play. Civil society will have a role to play. But who defines that role? Will it be intellectuals and think tanks who sit here in Prague? Or will it be in consultation with people from various African governments, institutions, stakeholders, etc.? Perhaps on that basis, one can see how, at a practical level, we can have a win-win situation that was spoken of earlier. Partnerships that are mutually beneficial. Partnerships that allow the Czech Republic to grow out of the opportunities presented to it by its bilateral relations with various African countries or through the partnership that the EU has with Africa. But we have to be consistent. We cannot at a bilateral level have one approach and then within the EU, our voices say something else. Consistency has to be there. And with your permission, Chair, I'll make one last um, remark regarding the EU and Africa's partnership. In most instances, it works well. But there has been one very thorny issue, which I'm sure uh, His Excellency, the Deputy Minister, is fully aware of, as are colleagues from the Foreign Ministry. And that has been the negotiations on the economic partnership agreements, where we have, 10 years later, not resolved outstanding and contentious issues which Africa finds very sensitive because it is going to be damaging to Africa's interests if we sign the partnership agreement as it is. Now, I do not know what the Czech Republic's stance is within the EU on the EPAs, but hence I say we have to be consistent at the bilateral level as well as at the multilateral level. We cannot send different signals. To be a small member of a big club like the European Union, sometimes you know how difficult you have to, or how loud you have to shout to have your voice heard. In Africa, it's the same thing. When Africa speaks to the EU, we wish to be heard. And sometimes those countries that are in a similar position as us may be able to sympathize with us, empathize with us, and therefore also be our spokespersons within the EU. And hence, we shall build confidence and we shall take our relationship further. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Ambassador, and thank you especially that you concluded with pointing the role or potential role of the Czech Republic in the process because that's, that allows me to uh, pass the floor directly to uh, Deputy Minister uh, Tomáš Dub. Thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear guests, dear friends. Uh, welcome at our ministry uh, and thanks for, thanks for coming. I, I will uh, try to start this presentation. Okay, uh, I have heard that uh, it's an uh, advantage that we haven't any uh, colonial history with African cartoons. That's true, and we are proud of that, uh, basically. But on the other hand, I must say that it means also some 
lack of information or historical information or experience. So we have uh, now much more focused in our thinking what's going on in Africa. Right? It's our advantage, but also we have uh, uh, to, to work uh, uh, more intensively. Um, I'm, of course, Africa is about politics, about security, and about economics. It's somehow connected, o always it's connected, but uh, I think that politics is known, security is improved, uh, what to do with economics? That's, uh, I think, big question. It was mentioned here that the China is active in Africa. China has a similar number of inhabitants like the whole Africa, right? Uh, I think that they are national partners. I, I have nothing against that. Um, I'm, I'm, I think that uh, because of Chinese investments in Africa, now Africa, I don't think that it's more rich, but at least it's, it's more open to, let's say, alternatives or uh, another ways, uh, another style of thinking. Um, and also, uh, from 2008, from the year, year 2008, there is another changes, because in that time, the crisis in Europe and uh, Northern America again. And I think that now we have a uh, different uh, view on Africa than it was before 2008 at least the Czech Republic, because in that time we were focusing on, on a more on our neighborhood, on, on the European Union or uh, European market. And uh, now, generally in Europe, we are pushed more to think about uh, what's going on in economics out of uh, uh, European borders. So I think that there are two main uh, changes, Chinese investment and the crisis in, in Europe and Northern America which are refocusing uh, us uh, towards, also towards uh, Africa. Uh, I'm also glad that uh, we have now uh, the 50th uh, uh, anniversary of the establishment of African Union, and we can, we can use this opportunity or anniversary to promote uh, our, our thinking of Africa, but also our future uh, uh, plans on, on that continent. I have here a presentation which is uh, in, in uh, um, Czech language, but uh, because we have to, to discuss Africa with Czechs, you know, to explain what's going on there. Uh, but I would like to show you that presentation and slightly to touch some, some part of that to explain how, uh, not details, but how we are thinking about Africa. Uh, because I think that, of course, there are possibilities in Africa. But you cannot be successful, successful uh, to use these opportunities if you are, don't understand them, if you don't understand them, right? So first we need to understand the processes inside Africa and then we can follow them and then we can uh, be active in, in them. So, nothing because it's too small but but anyway um, I would like to speak uh, shortly about the sources of uh, uh, African growth uh, then about African productivity then about African natural resources then about the possibility African possibilities of uh, economic development and then about uh, a reduction of uh, uh, poverty and also uh, I would like to conclude with case study uh, of Senegal, uh, like a good example of what, what maybe we can do in some African state. Uh, of course, at the beginning I must say that, uh, of course, that Africa is now uh, uh, fixed uh, among the main economic regions of the world, and, uh, and I am quite sure that Africa would remain there, no, no hesitation about that. You can see in that position also uh, chances, but also some weaknesses uh, uh, in, let's say, uh, our approach to Africa, but also in uh, uh, global African uh, development. So, uh, 
maybe that uh, about Africa which is important. Everybody knows that there are 54 states, but uh, uh, maybe the more uh, important uh, number is that uh, uh, the seven uh, African states are between the tens, the most uh, uh, growing, uh, economically growing states of the world. That's quite important. And for me, it's also important that uh, on a scale or of corruption, uh, or on corruption index uh, uh, 35 from uh, uh, 54 uh, of African states has a better position than, than Russia. So they are less corrupted uh, than, than Russia. 35, that's, that's the level of corruption is everywhere, even in Czech Republic, but I think it's quite, quite, quite positive. Nothing against Russia, but I think that gen general meaning is uh, here in our population that everything is corrupted everywhere, especially in Africa. So, so I think that we have to promote this, this, this figure. Um, and of course, uh, corruption is obstacle to, to economic growth and uh, to do investment and, and business. Then uh, on next slide, uh, you can see the whole world, but uh, uh, generally, this is uh, and the growth of, of GDP, and you can see it in. in um, you can compare here uh, the whole world, including Africa. Um, the growth uh, is to Africa is predicted for uh, five percent uh, uh, for this year and, and next year, and uh, maybe that the during the next twelve years. Uh, the economic size uh, of Africa would be doubled, which is also important. That it means that uh, this region would be stronger on the global market. Uh, what is necessary to do is that uh, African countries or entrepreneurs should focus to improve uh, uh, their productivity in some sectors you have already mentioned, like uh, food processing or agriculture, uh, of course. And I will show that later. But also, uh, what is important that, uh, and not very uh, effective right now, that uh, African countries depend on the demand uh, from, uh, let's say, more developed uh, part of the world, like is United, uh, yeah, like is Europe, uh, United States, or or Asia. So, I think that we have, or you have. African states uh, should uh, have uh, to focus more on uh, improving uh, production in some sectors uh, with really low uh, level of productivity. And also, uh, African states should focus more on, on their neighborhood. Maybe next slide you can see uh, the productivity in uh, agriculture, which is uh, uh, about uh, 36 percent, and uh, in uh, in mining industry, uh, it's uh, uh, 60 times uh, higher than, than than in agriculture. So uh, it means that uh, uh, in mining it's okay, but uh, there is a big chance uh, in, in agriculture for everybody who would be involved. Or from that, I can see there is a parent rule or law that. Uh, uh, 20% of uh, the whole activity in Africa is creating 80% of, of results, right? It's on the left or right side, right side. So this 20% is uh, creating 80% of results. Maybe on next slide, and that can be also important at least for Czech investors or entrepreneurs or businessmen. Sorry that you won't be probably able to to, to see in de all details, but at, uh, we, we see four important groups of, of countries in Africa. Those uh, which are oil exporters, uh, exporters, uh, they are uh, of course uh, they have uh, big export per capita. Uh, they are relatively rich also because they have a uh, big part of uh, GDP per capita. But uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, the industry is not developed there. 
and um, uh, still there are big uh, challenges in that countries. Then you have uh, uh, another group, which are countries uh, which are standing before transformation. Uh, they haven't, uh, they are not rich on racial, national resources. Uh, the industry is not uh, developed uh, and export uh, is not very high or effective. Then you have another gr group. These are transforming countries. Uh, these, these countries, uh, they haven't really also uh, big uh, national resources, but they are orienting themselves on production, on industry, uh, and still the export is not very high, but they are transforming. So we can wait that we can uh, expect that uh, export uh, will rise in, in future. And the fourth, uh, fourth group, which is known, uh, these countries are, uh, they have di di diversified economy, so uh, I they are successful in, in export, uh, they are relatively rich, and they are also uh, in economic development relatively stable, and of course uh, uh, the effectivity of labor is, is relatively high there. Maybe in next slide, uh, which is also important because uh, I think that everybody thinks that Africa is source of, of uh, natural uh, nature, uh, nature resources and that uh, everybody, including China, is importing from, from just uh, oil and whatever gas from Africa. But on that slide, you can see that uh, um, EU and North America are much more effective in the export of national resources and that they are using their comparative advantage. So it's something you have also to think about. And uh, uh, why it's, you know, uh, what is, why it, it looks like that? Um, uh, export of national and mining uh, should be also connected with some knowledge and, and maybe that uh, many times ago, uh, the Stanford University in California was based because of uh, the need of improving, uh, say, scale of, of uh, labor in mining industry. So uh, we, we have to think about the, the need in Africa uh, in that sector, not just to, uh, to have a simple mining industry and to export natural resources, but also to have well-developed labor force. Um, then, I think that this is detailed, but what is, I think the most important slide from the whole presentation is that one. And it's all, part of that is in English. Um, it's showing uh, the, the red part, intra-African trade, then the red one, then you have intra-North American trade, the biggest one, intra-Europe trade and intra-Asia trade. And it means that in Africa, there is a lack of economic integration. For me, it, it means there is a lack of economic in integration and probably uh, there is also technically lack of uh, infrastructure. But that's that really big disadvantage because the, like Czech Republic, for example, is doing the, the uh, biggest share of business with, with, with Germany or with our neighborhood. So it's natural to have uh, biggest part of the business with, with your neighbors. It, it should be the same in Africa. And uh, I think it, this is a serious problem and the most important uh, important slide from the whole presentation. Uh, then I'll just like, like to slightly touch uh, uh, something on, on left side. You can see uh, this is the left picture is about agriculture and right one is uh, about industry. And uh, you see uh, GDP per capita uh, and uh, in comparison with uh, a share of unemployment. In agriculture, it's, it's much more higher than in industry. Probably it, you cannot see details, but uh, it's visible, very visible from that graph. So uh, just showing that uh, uh, that uh, uh, 
the effectiveness uh, of the people working in agriculture is much more lower than uh, effectiveness of the people or effectivity of the people uh, working in industry. Uh, so it means that it's uh, necessary to reduce the number uh, of the people working in agriculture and to move them to industry uh, on the condition uh, uh, that uh, the productivity uh, of the labor should grow. So it's uh, quite important. Uh, maybe that uh, well, it's in check. Uh, if Africa is still based on agriculture and national resources, the industry should be connected with that. I don't think that uh, you will have your Africa Nokia or Riave or what, whatever. Uh, it, it needs to have some, some, uh, some logic, of course. And uh, uh, these two items are, I think, the most important to, th to think about. What to do um, uh, uh, with them, how to create infrastructure around them, how to create industry around them, how to um, uh, support or find uh, the export with, with higher uh, value uh, added, etc., etc. Maybe that the next slide can, because it's in this picture, so uh, it, you, you can see maybe still that over there. trend of, of uh, investment so it uh, if there will be known changes uh, probably there will be economic growth but uh, here you have here you have uh, poverty reduction so uh, it will have no effect on uh, how, how to uh, reduce poverty but if the labor would be moved to uh, the, uh, the sectors with higher productivity then it uh, would have serious effect uh, also to, to the reduction of poverty, and you can see the prediction here. So uh, I think it's really win-win. It can be win-win strat strategy if we will understand uh, where to invest and what to do there. Uh, so it cannot be focused just on, on, on profit, but also uh, on right thinking uh, of supporting uh, some sectoral changes. And uh, maybe at the end, I would like really uh, quickly to show you the Senegal, and it's about uh, about tomatoes. And here you can see that fresh tomatoes are, are produced in, in Senegal and exported from Senegal. But on on the right part, uh, the graph, there is an import of, of uh, final products from from to tomatoes to Senegal, back to Senegal. Which is strange because if you are if you are producing, uh, if you have good climate and if you are producing tomatoes, you should export fresh tomatoes. But you you, you should export. It's just confirming what I said before. But you should export also, also uh, the final products from tomato, and not to to uh, reimport them from some probably uh, European country. And uh, on the other slide, there is a market, basically. The great, uh, the great countries, uh, uh, you see, uh, we are lacking numbers, but uh, here you can see the import of, uh, um, of fresh tomatoes. Uh, the biggest import is Ghana, but also uh, see here the figures, because on another slide you will you will see another picture, which is. Uh, um, which is a market with final products uh, of tom tomato, which is much more developed. And it means that uh, uh, Senegal really can be very successful if uh, there will be some food processi processing uh, in, in that country. And at least uh, there is there is market, uh, very open market uh, to, to export uh, in Africa, in neighborhood. So, uh, probably it works right now that uh, Senegal is exporting fresh tomatoes somewhere to, to Europe, some, some European country, and from that European country, uh, uh, tomatoes, uh, final products from tomatoes are exported back to Africa. It is strange for me, and there is, uh, I think, one chance for Czech companies uh, to, to be active in that and to invest in, in uh, that kind of, 
and production and uh, to have profit, uh, but profit will be also in, in Senegal. I, this is just an example. You can you can you can use any country and any any sector. Uh, but uh, just confirming there is there is a lack uh, of uh, inter-African trade and big changes in that, and there is a lack of uh, food processing based on agriculture, uh, the same in mining, and uh, this is something uh, we can be like checks active in and to have uh, really uh, good results and good business, and uh, I would like to conclude that everybody is focusing on export right now, and that's that's correct, and this is the result of some kind of economic uh, situation in Europe, but I think that uh, for, say, longer perspective, it's much more important to focus on, on, on our investment uh, to African state, especially to African state, because the, the opportunities are the biggest there, uh, and on our in investment there uh, with connection of future export possibilities. And that's something which is, uh, I think, very um, uh, important for Czech businessmen uh, we have to explain that because, as I said, we haven't so generally so big experience uh, uh, with Africa like the others, and we have to work on that. So this is uh, uh, just an example how we are thinking about Africa, uh, but uh, I, I'm quite sure that this is the most effective way, like not just to speak, but also to, to be active there. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Deputy Minister, for the very comprehensive and concise overview of, of uh, uh, the special economic situation in Africa. And now, because we are slightly running out of time, I'll pass the floor directly to uh, Peter Labeda. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, your excellencies, uh, Deputy Minister. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for invitation and uh, for organizing this uh, this event. And uh, I would also like to congratulate uh, uh, Ambassador Brandeo and uh, other representatives of Africa uh, for the 10th anniversary of the African Union and for the achievements uh, that uh, we really see coming from Africa. I think that this is no um, uh, coincidence that we are talking about uh, Africa rising and. Uh, uh, that we also uh, talk about Africa seen as rising, which may be two different things, because Africa has been rising for a while, but it's been only noticed uh, fairly recently, I would say. Uh, I would like to cover two clusters of issues and try to be brief so that we have uh, some space for the discussion. And one of them is the global perspective, the post-2015 framework, which has been mentioned by Ambassador Bramdeo here. Um, and then the role of the Czech Republic in the different, uh, different sectors and try to provide a slightly alternative uh, uh, perspective uh, to, to uh, Czech-African relationships or perhaps to EU-African relationships. Um, to me, probably if I should try to summarize the current status of the post-2015 discussion, that is the discussions about the new development framework which will probably come into force in 2015 after the Millennium Development Goals have expired. Uh, so the key moment for me is the narrative opportunity. I think that the positive approach, which is being channeled uh, from all the levels of the negotiations from different uh, regions, except perhaps Europe and the West, because the past decade has been the most successful decade in the history of all continents, except Europe and perhaps North America. Uh, so we might be a bit skeptical about that uh, uh, and about the upbeat situation uh, or about the upbeat uh, statements here. But I do think that there's, there's a lot of data to support that. Uh, and there's also quite some graphical expressions of that. I've recently acquired uh, a magazine in Africa. And uh, you start seeing this kind of advertisement, you know, with the uh, uh, bright young African guys uh, running business, being active, uh, approaching the world. Uh, we don't see, you know, this kind of images in, uh, in Europe or in this country uh, almost at all. And I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a pity because uh, it locks us into an old kind of uh, thinking which doesn't really help, uh, help uh, Africa to move and doesn't help us to move in the relation to Africa. So, uh, as uh, recently at an OECD meeting on development, Angel Curia, the, the head of the OECD, noted, uh, we have to highlight the progress 
but not, it's not time to celebrate yet. And I would like to really mention a few of the social indicators. We have uh, heard about the economic indicators, about the uh, top economic achievers coming from Sub-Saharan Africa, but we also have the top uh, poverty reduction achievers coming actually from the Sub-Saharan Africa in the recent time. Uh, some of the countries are very uh, doing quite well on a number of indicators. The whole continent is, is doing uh, quite well on a couple of the MDGs, in fact. For instance, the primary education is one of the biggest achievements that's or that already can be, uh, can be celebrated. Uh, there's a much lower HIV AIDS prevalence, especially in the 15 to 24 group. This is a very important uh, message and very Im important um, uh, development factor for Africa. There's more access to antiretroviral drugs as well. But the, something that also Lydia mentioned, and that is, that is very important, uh, the gender aspect is improving in Africa. Uh, many of the countries uh, in Africa are now close to gender parity in education. That means we are having uh, as many girls in schools as boys in Africa. Um, and this is also translating into politics because there's many more women in parliaments uh, in Africa. I guess that can be something to inspire also, uh, also the, rest of the rest of the world, including this, uh, this country. <laughs> Uh, so there are, there are, there are definitely uh, important uh, progresses to, to watch and to support, yet we still need to acknowledge the challenges that we are, uh, that we are facing in, uh, in Africa. And I think the major one probably is inequalities, because the economic growth has not uh, necessarily uh, produced jobs and increase in living standards for everyone. In fact, it has only improved the uh, living standards for a uh, for few and still the countries who have some kind of uh, equitable inclusive growth are rather exception than the, than the rule. So the empl employment, uh, especially employment of the, gr of the youth, is a, is, a, is a big challenge and we have uh, witnessed uh, what kind of force the youth can be if they don't have uh, jobs um, in the Arab Spring um, and we still wait uh, we are still waiting you know, for the results of this, of this uh, phenomenon. Uh, but definitely this is, this is an agenda to work, uh, work on. And then if I should highlight just one more issue, probably it's, uh, it's social services and social protection as a, uh, as a key for resilience, for uh, protection and improvement of the situation of the, of the most vulnerable uh, groups uh, in Africa. The key... Uh, Another key element of the post-2015 development agenda evolves around so-called uh, critical or key drivers or enablers, if you want, of development. Um, that's definitely technological innovation, and I can cite a few examples of uh, the research we have done recently uh, on Ethiopia and Ethi in Ethiopia. Uh, in e Ethiopia is, is uh, one of the first countries to actually run uh, an effective commodity exchange based in Addis Abeba uh, with international support. And one of the, one of the projects there actually is to sharing the information about the price movements through mobile cell phones with farmers in distant villages. This is, this is definitely a way how to improve both the market, market functioning, uh, as well as the situation and information of the, of the poorest and most uh, vulnerable people. So there's definitely room for technology to play, but the technology will not be the solution uh, if there is not enough investment into human and institutional development, uh, which is the backbone of any successful economy and any successful society for that, uh, for that matter. So uh, what can be done by uh, Czech Republic in uh, regards of, of support of the African, African development? In the first place, I always remember when talking about the relations that uh, my friend who's been uh, heading uh, at the time of the research, one of the big international NGOs, came to me and said, Peter, you know, uh, things changed in Africa. Uh, Europe is viewed very differently. Uh, much, uh, there is, there is, uh, I mean, we are not really a beat, even the civil society, uh, are, uh, about the Chinese influence. We are actually quite skeptical and critical, but that doesn't mean that we want to be coming back to the old ways of development as it's been imposed uh, and argued for by Europe. And you need to get adjusted to that. You have to change your approach. You have to really take us as a partners and offer uh, a win-win 
solutions as was, was mentioned here, but on a different basis. Uh, there has to be certain modesty, uh, there has to be uh, the narrative of opportunity, and there has to be a genuine efforts to, uh, uh, to help. So this is the first thing, and, uh, and I would really hi highlight here uh, the need to start perceiving, it's almost a psych psychological issue, uh, Africa as a, as a different, different continent and uh, as, a, as a place of uh, opportunities, but not just business, business opportunities, but also opportunities for, uh, for social and environmental development, because uh, we are all aware probably very clearly of the uh, limits that the current model of growth has. And uh, Ambassador Bramdeo mentioned that here, Lydia also alluded to, uh, to the need to really struggle hard for inclusive and green or sustainable uh, growth model in Africa while benefiting from a high rates of economic growth um, in this decade, perhaps in one more decade, uh, would be running of its own uh, engine for growth if we don't take care uh, uh, really of the issue of uh, uh, the resources and the environmental and social aspects of the, of the growth. Uh, one of the biggest challenges also that we are discussing with the civil society partners, and I don't have any easy, uh, straightforward answer to that, is governance. I think it's a much more difficult issue than, than it looks like, and it, it's not just about corruption. And uh, actually, honestly, um, starting about two years ago, uh, the, the head, basically, of the central Bohemian region, uh, as, you might, as you might know, some of you, is just now facing a charge of corruption in this, very, in this very country. I lost confidence, actually, to talk about corruption with Africans, to be honest, because, uh, especially in Ethiopia, which is, which is one of the countries with the least endemic uh, if you compare this with the cases that we are witnessing now in the Czech Republic, it kind of doesn't really sound very fair, you know, to, uh, to, 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 be, to be discussing, discussing uh, large-scale corruption issues. Yet, there's a lot we can do uh, to really improve the situation and help focusing on the governance part, on the many practical aspects of running a country uh, from the technical to the more, to the more political uh, aspects. And the Czech Republic, in fact, is trying to transfer some of its transformative know-how to help these transitions um, in, 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 the, in the different uh, countries. Uh, including in Africa. I just remember uh, one person to make a clear point. Uh, uh, to my knowledge, one of the few Czech investors in Ethiopia who's been sitting in Addis Ababa and waiting for about two or three months just to have a few interviews to consult his investment plans with the, uh, with the local government. So this is obviously the kind of uh, situation that is not really helping and is not stimulating uh, uh, investment, uh, let alone from smaller, uh, smaller countries which don't have the clout of the big governments and the big international uh, or bilateral deals to support, support the investment. So there's definitely uh, a lot to improve. Uh, the, fo the focus that uh, a lot of the NGOs and civil society has here is, of course, on the development cooperation. And uh, this is changing too. This is, this, is, this, is, this is changing rapidly. We are witnessing a different role of uh, the NGOs in the South. Definitely, we have to also become uh, much more of the partners and subcontractors driven by, uh, by the needs, by the strategies, and by the act activities uh, of the southern partners. Uh, there's a question uh, whether the uh, classical aid will not uh, need to be refocused a lot more on the so-called uh, fragile and conflict states, not just because of the security development uh, nexus that's been mentioned here, but also because uh, basically m many or majority of the least developed countries uh, are stricken by the situation and those who are, who are benefiting from the more stable, secure, peaceful um, conditions are moving up to, to middle income countries. Uh, there's still the challenge of how to treat the 75% of the poor people who are living in the middle income countries. In fact, at the moment, we don't have the majority of poor people in the poor countries, but in the countries who are uh, already faring quite, quite well. So this is, this is an additional uh, challenge. But it's not only about, um, about the aid. It's also about what we do here in the Czech Republic. Uh, it's also about what we do in our bilateral and multilateral relations. So let me make just a few final points on this, on this, on this account. Uh, the civil society, I think, is starting to change the 
perception and the debate about about uh, development and about Africa. And I think this is our role, uh, indeed, to to try to change the public perception of, of the poverty and of Africa into this narrative of opportunity, into this positive uh, positive approach, and also to explain the wider links. One of the most challenging areas of development cooperation, in fact, is so-called policy coherence uh, for development. This is uh, an effort to try to um, limit negative impacts of non-development policies on the poor countries. This is, uh, uh, this is concerning policies like agriculture policy, trade policy, investment policy, uh, financial and security. And on all these, uh, on these accounts, there is, uh, there is room for, uh, for the Czech Republic to, uh, to get better and for the EU to improve its performance. I want to be talking about the arm exports uh, or uh, the nitty-gritty stuff of reforming the common agriculture policy, but let me uh, let me just focus on the biofuels that was that was mentioned mentioned here. Um, uh, this is this is a difficult uh, difficult situation, and we are witnessing a major land grabs also in Ethiopia. It's actually one of the countries which are suffering from the most um, uh, of this so-called large-scale export-oriented uh, mono-industrial uh, investments into into agriculture, uh, with very uh, very dubious impacts actually on, on the local economy, uh, including the tax systems and, uh, and, and, and local, uh, local environment. But it's, 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 a, it's a very tough issue to uh, approach just, pan just by one policy, because in biofuels, you actually see uh, the crossing of the trade policy, of the investment policy, of the agriculture policy, and of the climate policy. Because actually the key driver for biofuels is our effort to prevent climate change. Uh, which is another uh, very important factor in African development. And Ethiopia, in fact, is a country which uh, uh, already suffers uh, big hits from, uh, from the impacts of the, of the climate change. Uh, so it's not an easy, an easy issue, and we have to really think twice uh, about how to well link the interventions in different policies so that one hand is not doing something else than the, uh, than the other hand. Uh, in case of uh, Ethiopia, in fact, what we have uh, what we have seen, and some of for those of you who are interested in more, I have a few copies of this study. It's also to to be found on our on our website. In Ethiopia, is in fact the land grabs and biofuels policy of the EU uh, has been an initiator of the problems, but the EU is no longer the key driver of these policies. This role has been actually taken over by the Gulf states, by uh, India. Uh, and by other, the BRIC, BRIC so-called BRICS um, investors, which has used the pattern, but now are running this, this kind of large-scale investment policies on their, on their own. And there is also complacency of the Ethiopian government, which uh, supports this kind of uh, um, investments. What I want to say is not really to criticize the government or, or the BRICS, but to show that a lot of the issues that are crucial for the future of Africa are global problems, and they don't have solutions only in uh, the change of African policies. Uh, they don't have a uh, solution in just change of bilateral relations or by regional relations, which is the EU-Africa strategy. They only have solutions in multilateral diplomatic negotiations on issues such as climate change, on issues such as uh, the trade liberalization, the stalled Doha round, on issues such as labor migration, uh, investment policy, or financial architecture that will, prov that, will, that will, for instance, prevent a huge capital flight, which is occurring, uh, still occurring in Africa. So all of these elements, in fact, will become uh, um, probably the building stones of the new post-2015 development framework. And we as Czech Republic and Europe, we should help to negotiate this grand bargain. Uh, and uh, I believe that it's, 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 it's one of the, our roles uh, not to be uh, present uh, more present in Africa physically, and I would like to uh, really uh, appreciate the move of the Ministry for Foreign Affairs to reopen um, the embassy in uh, in Dakar. And I believe that the analysis of the potato market was probably one of the one of the reasons contributing to this uh, to this fact. Uh, but we also have to be uh, be working with Africa on other fora uh, to be uh, to be able uh, to help to solution of this kind of problems that none of us separately or individually uh, can, can resolve on the longer term uh, and more, more systemic, uh, systemic problems that, that, that Africa, Africa is facing. So this is, this, is, this is probably the short, uh, short contribution 
from myself, one of the very uh, last uh, recommendations I would have, and I would like to really engage the Ministry for Foreign Affairs in this, in this work as well, is uh, an instrument which is almost as big uh, and could be probably as effective as uh, the Czech bilateral development aid, also in relation to Africa, and that's, uh, that's the climate uh, finance project. So basically the projects to, uh, uh, to try to help with adaptation and mitigation of the poor countries as a result of, uh, uh, of the climate change impacts. And uh, there, has, there, there, is, there is a law, uh, actually by one of the few countries in Europe, in the Czech Republic, which uh, commits the government to use part of the revenues from the so-called emission trading system to finance uh, projects in developing countries, uh, the climate-related project in developing countries. Uh, but again, as with, with the PCD, uh, there is, uh, there is a, com a bit of competence of the Ministry of Finance, a bit of competence of the Ministry of Environment, a bit of competence of Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs. I'm a bit worried you know, that actually nobody will really pick up the issue and move it forward. And when the time comes to say, yeah, this is the part of the resources of the revenues we want to invest in Africa or elsewhere, in climate-related projects that stimulate local growth and uh, at the same time uh, uh, reduce poverty and help to prevent the climate change, that we might miss the opportunity. So please, let's, let's take for instance, this, this one example as a practical uh, way to also move forward the development agenda. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Peter, for, for the very concrete um, uh, suggestions. Uh, we still have about 20 minutes so uh, I'd like to, I've got some questions myself, but I'd like to give the floor first to you and uh, open the discussion, open the floor for any questions or comments for any of the speakers. Yes, please, could you always identify yourself and then pose the question? Yeah, there's a micro. Me? Yeah. yeah. Thank you for giving me uh, an opportunity. My name is Said Khalifa from Ethiopia. But uh, my party is more of Czech than now of Ethiopian. I'm proud of that because I've been given a, an opportunity, opportunity to have a scholarship and to study and to live and to be part of Czech society. So I feel more, mm, uh, uh, more, more responsibility for this country than Ethiopia, but I feel still uh, mm, mm, uh, uh, certain certain responsibility for my destination, my, my birth country. So uh, let me thank Mr. Labet. It's fully, I can say, it's fully truth what he presented here. Um, most of presenters, unfortunately, uh, I don't mean uh, from this uh, room, but uh, in newspaper, in media, they are presenting uh, baseless, uh, not uh, fact-based information so that also has a, a contribution to uh, perception of the society, the investors, and so on. So this is uh, uh, basically a fact-based information. Let me thank you. Uh, and uh, everything what is uh, told is more or less uh, truth. So um, regarding uh, mm, bureaucracy, corruption, uh, everything is told. but. One thing comes into my mind. How it is possible we can deliver tanks, bullets, a lot of uh, 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 net healthy uh, business with African countries, but it is very difficult and bureaucratic to deliver uh, tractors and uh, other uh, 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 mm, uh, technologies which can contribute for the development of the society and the continent, as well as uh, mutual understanding of uh, these two countries or nations. So I see that uh, there should be more and more effort to improve this situation. It's possible always to deal with uh, whatever country, but uh, you know, the, the way we uh, you know, give a priority is very important for, for, for uh, our mutual communication and development works. So uh, to summarize, it's uh, everybody in this room has got a mobile phone. That comes, the, the uh, raw materials come from Africa. But it's possible to import those uh, raw materials, but it is not possible to deliver 
uh, in, uh, in, in uh, uh, reverse uh, technology and know-how and so on. It's less, less work is d uh, you know, happening there. It's possible to do business. Uh, there are so many problems, but we can deal with that. Thank you for this. This is just uh, my, my feeling. It should not be uh, true. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Perhaps we'll collect more questions and comments and then answer them all in one go. Yes, please. Opportunity. Um, at the beginning of your presentation, Mrs. Uh, Boca, you, you mentioned two success stories, one of them being Capo Verde. Well, what you didn't say is that Capo Verde, like Wanda, didn't do its uh, success by itself. Uh, I'm very glad to say that over 20 years, Luxembourg is a partner in development for Capo Verde. But this is only a drop in the baking stone. And uh, I'm very grateful to Mr. Brandeo, uh, Ambassador. You, you, you mentioned the importance of the developing relationship between AU and EU. We just last year opened a permanent delegation in Addis Ababa. And if we hadn't this, we could invest years and years ongoing. And maybe we will not invest anymore because there is the Euro crisis. But without this institutional framework, we will do nothing. So everyone is important in Africa. And Czech Republic has a wonderful um, investment in archaeology in Sudan. And we, we really respect them for this. But the institutional building is very important. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions or comments? In the first round. Yes, please. Thank you very much. My name is Tony Smith, uh, Chiganda from Uganda. Uh, I'm just, I just have a comment to make, and I think I'll, I'll refer more to China and Africa relations. Um, many say that China, uh, in the long run, we're going to get the same thing that happened prior with Europe. Now, China has been strategic in Africa. Well, while uh, providing infrastructure, it's also providing education. In Beijing alone, China offers more than 100 scholarships annually to African countries. Now that is strategic with China. My comment is uh, what Europe should do or what Czech Republic must do should be more strategic if they have to cross with China. Um, when you consider other aspects, um, applying for a Czech visa or applying for a European visa is more difficult for Africans to attain. And th that being said, uh, it becomes difficult for even members to be able to collaborate with European countries. African countries still have a perspective that Europe, uh, the, I'm sorry, the colonial aspect still embedded in the African mind. Like Alice said, Czech has no colonial effects. Uh, Mr. Peter just commented that if Czech could invest more in, in climate mitigations. Africa, recent, Africa is, going to start pro, is going to start production very soon. And by so doing, it will pollute. It will pollute. We're saying this should, it should pollute. I think the Czech should uh, invest more in climate mitigation and also try to provide scholarship for African countries to be able to participate along with Czech Republic. Thank you. Teskalik from the University of Economics. I have a question for Mr. Dupe. Uh, as, it was, as it has been mentioned in part, uh, there were governments in Africa where a good chunk of them uh, has studied in uh, Czechoslovakia, they even spoke Czech. There have been heads of state in Africa who had studied in Czechoslovakia and uh, they spoke, for example, the Seychelles president. I'd like to ask whether the Czech Republic now tries to uh, make some special profit from this, uh, from this fact, for example, is there some special approach to the governments or head of state who have this uh, special relationship to, towards the uh, Czech Republic? Thanks. Okay. Uh, so let's, let's start answering in the reverse order, starting with Peter. Would you like to comment on any of the questions? 
questions. Uh, just, uh, just very briefly, on uh, if I if I got uh, correctly the point of uh, of our friend from uh, Ethiopia, uh, how it really fostered in industrialization um, in in Africa. Um, I think this is this is a really good uh, good question. I don't have any uh, any direct response because in 10 years ago we, we would have been all thinking, you know, that Africa is the natural next uh, uh, global industrial base because of the of the of the resources, because of the cheap uh, labor, because of the proximity to the markets, and it didn't it didn't really happen. Uh, so the, the the question comes comes back. Um, with more rigor now, and my my simple response be that it's 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 really that we need to invest much more into the the human and institutional development in in helping uh, the education, the the social capital building in these countries, the institutional uh, background for 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 the whole economy to uh, to work. It's also a way basically to uh, improve the internal market uh, functioning in in the EU because it's not just the lack of diversity of the uh, African economies that causes um, basically, the lack, lack, lack of the in internal or deficiencies in the African internal market, but it's also the internal demand. You know, it's if, if we don't have a um, qualified, well-educated um, uh, labor force which receives some chunk of the benefits of the growth, so that they can spend the money on uh, on the on the local economy, on the global economy, it's really difficult to see how we can build uh, a, s a stronger industrial base in in Africa. Uh, on the climate mitigation question, I think that this is this is this is this is the this is the right point, and you could even argue that this is in in, in very own uh, interest of the Czech Republic, even regardless of the impacts of the of the climate change, because in the long term, uh, the green technologies and the green markets are, are being uh, are, are going to be uh, a really good opportunity, and we can see the example of the Germany. Uh, how it's thriving uh, in these in these new sectors of the of the glo global economy. It's uh, it's a, it's really uh, a very progressive export uh, sector, and it's been also very resilient throughout the crisis. Uh, by the way, so the investment into um, uh, more energy efficiency, into uh, greener in the green technologies and services and and products is a uh, investment which is valid per se, uh, but it has this very important added uh, benefit of also helping to resolve one of the major global issues and also helping to uh, improve, at least improve the situation uh, in Africa. Ambassador Brandel. Well, thank you. I, I think um, we need to be mindful that when we talk of uh, industrializing Africa, there is a joint um, strategy that UNIDO has with the African Union for the industrial development of Africa. And I think we are now finally in the takeoff stage for industrialization in Africa. As I mentioned in my intervention, I think sometimes there are forces beyond our control as Africans in the global sphere that uh, prevent us from achieving those goals that we set ourselves. Sometimes we do it ourselves because of uh, not having the, the capacity, perhaps, to, to follow through on our commitments. But be that as it may, um, I think the issue of us having a very youthful population, probably the largest percentage of whom are educated as ever before, We've got the glass ceiling that had been placed on women in the mainstream economy and politics, etc., being removed increasingly. So you have more women in politics, in private sector, in decision-making positions in Africa now than ever before. All of this taps into the human capacity that we have available. The skills base is broader and therefore the economies can only benefit more. So when an investor comes into Africa, let that investor try and share the risk of investing. There is nothing that prevents any investor from bringing their technology, their skills, etc., and going into joint ventures in Africa. Let the local um, entrepreneur 
also benefit so that it's not just an international investor who comes in and sets up an operation and is operating in isolation from the, the local business environment. Also, investing in the social capital, I think, is very important. We need to look at a healthy, youthful population who will be more productive. And certainly, you, you are aware of uh, the, the large number of uh, um, illnesses that uh, the African population is exposed to, some of them which should have been eradicated a long time ago, like tuberculosis, malaria, etc. So health becomes an important issue. The Czech Republic has got certain strengths in terms of IT, um, machinery, uh, technology, uh, automate, automotive uh, vehicles, um, etc. And I think all of this should be uh, um, made available, if I may put it that way, to Africa. Find suitable markets. At the moment, we have about one billion people on the continent. By 2050, we are going to be two billion people. We have a rising middle class. So the market is there. It's a question of tapping into that market finding the right product that the Czech Republic can start exporting and uh, making use of the market that is there. Um, by the same token, I think the, the, um, the transfer of skills becomes important. One cannot, as an investor, simply move in, uh, not develop uh, the, the human resource, and then just withdraw at any future date. Um, it therefore becomes important uh, to, to um, educate people, uh, to leave behind something, and to create decent jobs. Not just jobs. It's easy to create a job. But what we would like is a decent job. Give people careers where they can develop, where they can exploit to their fullest that potential which they have. So I think, uh, Chair, these are some of the comments I would like to make. Thanks. Minister. Thank you also. OK, just as I understand, uh, basically three, four questions. Uh, first was about uh, our obstacles in our export, some uh, administrative obstacles. But I don't see we are controlling our military export because we would like to export our arms uh, to create peace and uh, not to support war. So that's why it's, it's regulated uh, by, by the state in Czech Republic, but the rest I think it's, 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 uh, it's very free. So I don't think that this is uh, a real issue uh, to discuss. Um, generally, we, we are against any obstacles and also on the level of European Union, we are supporting FTA agreements uh, with various parts of the world, including Africa. Then uh, uh, the second question probably was about uh, a visa, about issuing visas uh, for uh, entering Czech Republic. Uh, this has, let's say, two limitations. Uh, first, rules. Um, as, as you know, we, we have we are, uh, Schengen space, so uh, um, we are issuing our visas uh, according to the rules of, of Schengen. Uh, we cannot change that, but uh, this is the common in the United States. And there is a technical infrastructure for issuing visas, and we haven't so many embassies uh, in Africa, so maybe uh, technically it's, it's sometimes difficult. But uh, what we are doing now is that uh, we, have, we, are, we already have some agreements, and uh, we are increasing the number of agreements with other Schengen countries to issue visas instead of us. So that, 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 that works simply, and um, you can get uh, visa, check visa on somewhere on German embassy or Italian or French or whatever. And of course, we are also uh, uh, issuing visas of, uh, on behalf of another uh, Schengen state. So generally, I think it's a system which works. Uh, and the lack of technical infrastructure in Africa uh, should be solved throughout uh, another embassies. Then uh, I think the biggest uh, question was about uh, scholarships. 
And yes, we have uh, provided uh, thousands of scholarships from uh, 50s, last century. Um, well, it's oh, the part of that is almost history. Of course, uh, now uh, we are in different situation. Uh, before the revolution in uh, 1988 here in Czech Republic, uh, issuing uh, or uh, support of scholarship was more politically uh, base than it's it's now now, now now I think that we are it's it's not politics in that because we are not superpowers so we would like to to see more effectivity uh, uh, in uh, using uh, our Czech scholarship we cannot compete to China of course that that's a different uh, <laughs> scale different size but uh, what we can do here in, in Czech Republic that we are now discussing sectors or um, type of universities. Uh, also, there is some kind of language barrier because we can provide uh, education here in Czech or English, and it's not so. In some part of Africa, it should be more French, as I understand. Uh, and um, we are now offering about 120 uh, uh, scholarships per year, so it's still a big number for us. Uh, um, and we will focus more on, let's say, uh, the role of uh, the students which have studied in Czech Republic in, in uh, economic development on, on in our partner country, countries. N not just on economics, but also uh, other sectors, but technical education can be, for example, uh, the priority. Of course, you have mentioned that there are groups of uh, 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 foreigners which are speaking Czech still in the world, in uh, many countries. Uh, and uh, the embassy, um, uh, if we have embassy there, is in contact with, with them, and most of them, uh, they are in some connection with Czech Republic, or they are involved in, in business, doing business with Czech Republic. Uh, some of them are o o already in, pe in pension, it's life. So I think that the system is, is alive. Uh, uh, but uh, there are some uh, significant changes. What was before, uh, what is the history, and what is the future? Simply, yeah. Thank you, Ms. Boka. Please. Thank you very much. I take the, the comment on China. I think anything that takes Africa back to uh, some patterns should be avoided. What are these things? Any relationship that um, tends to translate into exporting raw commodities and importing, I'm just um, saying, uh, importing manufactured goods takes Africa back to, to the 60s and should be avoided. Fortunately, African leaders are aware of that. And um, the problem with the relationship with China is precisely that. It's a huge manufacturer. It's the manufacturer of the world. And uh, it sells its goods to Africa. And it imports non-renewable um, commodities. It's, uh, it gives African countries a great um, um, negotiating power re relative to its traditional uh, partners. But that's my problem with China, if any. Secondly, um, I'd like to make a comment on, on the visa issue. Um, a lot of uh, my clients complain about access to African visas, and this is not directed to you. It's more directed to the African Union and uh, people working in African integration. Among African countries themselves, there are difficulties in uh, obtaining visas. Sometimes it's easier if you carry two passports to use the other one. So these are hard facts. Africa needs to deal with. Um, then uh, uh, the lady mentioned uh, Cape Verde and the cooperation with Luxembourg. Uh, Cape Verde is indeed a small country, um, but there are big regional powerhouses that are doing also better these days. Um, South, South Africa, of course, now also Angola, although it's commodity-based, Nigeria, Kenya in the east, and it's important for the Czech Republic to be uh, to have a field presence. If I may add one one more, 
uh, it's the comment made by the Deputy Minister uh, regarding um, regarding uh, investing in sectors that are productive or that uh, bring growth. Um, these sectors at this time, unfortunately, are commodity related. They are oil and gas. And typically, these are sectors that bring a lot of foreign direct investment, but that do not employ many people. What employs people in Africa at the moment is still agriculture, although it accounts for about 20, 30% of GDP. This is the sector where you can make a dent in poverty in rural area, where 70% um, of the population still is. There are very credible studies showing that this is the area where you can make a change in poverty. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, as our uh, panel is drawing to an end, I'd like just very briefly to conclude by saying that what is clearly needed is a uh, paradigm shift in the perception in the European Union vis-a-vis uh, Africa. And in that connection, I just want to uh, point to um, very briefly to an example which perhaps you might be aware of. There has been recently in the Czech Republic a anti-corruption campaign by, by several Czech NGOs and there one of the main speakers there is a young guy from Botswana uh, explaining uh, uh, the Czech society how they should, of course it's very controversial, but still it, it draw, uh, drew, drew attention to that problem and he's trying to explain how to fight against corruption. So I think that this paradigm shift from uh, our European assistance to Africa is taking place and that now we are talking more about mutual cooperation, mutual learning process. And uh, with that, I would like to uh, ask all our speakers, uh, please join me in thanking them again. Um, and before we conclude and before we move, and you are of course all invited to, to a buffet lunch, I'd like to pass the floor to uh, the representative of the Prague Zoological Garden, surprisingly perhaps for some of you, because we've got downstairs an exhibition and we'll just hear a brief explanation about that. Good morning, I am uh, Hanna Geroldova. I am working for the Prague Zoo as uh, in-situ projects coordinator. It means uh, that we have projects abroad, so one of our projects is in Cameroon, that's why we have exhibition here. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank the ministry for great support and for uh, fruitful cooperation. And then I would like to invite you to see the exhibition. It's uh, about our activities in Cameroon and also in Central Africa, uh, not only in Cameroon, but also in Uganda and uh, Congo. And so uh, please enjoy it. It's uh, about our project which, which is called Wandering Bus, and uh, you can see all the way uh, we have taken to, to go to this project. And this project is a development project, and it's focused on children and on education, and uh, also on protection of uh, endangered species, mainly gorillas. I also would like to uh, excuse Mr. Director, who wanted to open the exhibition himself, but maybe you know that we are going through difficult times in zoo. We are, <laughs> paradoxically, we are saving our own gorillas in the zoo right now. So please uh, excuse him. And uh, I declare the exhibition open, so enjoy it. Thank you, and now uh, we are all invited to a buffet lunch, which will take place, uh, if you just go along this corridor, then turn left, you will, you will see it all there. Thank you very much. Thank you.